uh, Tone Tom, I decided just to tell stories and, uh, and have fun. But uh, since this is being printed, uh, I'm going to give you a, a summary somewhat more serious. And uh, on the topic of uh, decency and diplomacy, I don't know who put me in to do decency and diplomacy. I hope it was a nice thought, uh, and not, uh, not one done ironically. But um, uh, you can judge. Decency and diplomacy, yeah. Some uh, academics write that uh, any conflict, the conflict between morality and diplomacy is easy, easy to resolve. The state only has one moral course, and that is to pursue the national interest. The state is not at all like an individual. Uh, an individual may be required or want to follow some sort of uh, moral <coughs> con conduct, but the state only exists to further the general, or as we call it, the national interest. And therefore, any action which the state undertakes or its representatives undertake on its behalf in pursuit of that goal is, by definition, moral. End of story. Good night. Go home. Well, maybe not, not just yet. I think every one of us can think immediately of examples where some states, God forbid our own, uh, have acted immorally. It's less clear if at the time those sinners among the states uh, did not actually believe that they were indeed acting in the national interest. But it's now become commonplace. Uh, indeed, it's essential for media and commentators to judge all foreign policy actions according to some scale of morality. And this, in turn, has resulted in governments seeking to portray all or at least most of their actions as morally justified and usually even morally necessary even when that effort is patently ludicrous. So uh, this essay looks at the various categories of state action and see how they rate on a scale of morality versus national interest. Uh, and this is something I put forward so you can have fun tonight in uh, thinking of other examples, and I've just thrown out a few examples. Uh, but I'm going to take it, uh, divide state actions into four categories, obvious categories those which are both moral and in the national interest. Uh, secondly, those uh, which are mo uh, motivated by morality uh, rather than by the national interests. Uh, those which are in the national interest but amoral. And best fun of all, those which fail on both grounds are neither moral nor the national interest. And you'd be pleased to hear there's lots of them. Um, so play this game, play this game tonight at home. Uh, and then I might say in the end, in, in, in deference to the title, I will go into some uh, uh, outrageous comments about decency. Uh, so let's look at cases where, there, where states have acted largely out of moral considerations and not really motivated in the main by national interest concerns. And you may not believe it, but there are in fact some. Uh, the best of them, of course, uh, come in the international relief domain. Uh, cyclone and earthquake relief, combating outbreak of diseases like Ebola in distant places, distant places, refugee rescue. These are sorts of things which spring to mind. Uh, now, not all of them, of course, are exclusively motivated by altruism. Uh, the closer the event to home, uh, the more the considerations of national interest will emerge. And Australia. Uh, for example, will more easily provide cyclone relief to, say, Indonesia and, Vi and Vanuatu than to, say, Haiti. But we did provide cyclone relief to Haiti, so you know, we have been, uh, we have been uh, an example of this uh, category. And the Australian government, of course, was uh, similarly caught on the hook here. Uh, our, Australia's decision to follow the U.S. into Iraq in 2003 was surely an es essentially an exercise U.S. alliance management, and thus a national interest matter, but it had to be portrayed in the media and the public as pursuing some moral endeavor. In fairness, I'd certainly concede that uh, ideas of what is moral do change, and sometimes dramatically over time. We now look back in horror at the slave trade, eagerly pursued only a century and a half ago, and thus considered a quite acceptable basis then for a large number of states' foreign policies, policy actions. Um, similarly, the British government, uh, slightly more recently, waged opium wars, for God's sake, uh, against China, uh, showing an appalling sense of morality by any criterion except apparently those of the time. 
every generation looks back at the previous one and wonders what on earth were they thinking. Personally, I suspect that future generations will look back at the live export trade, for example, in that way. But I'd argue that even today, we have to accept that acting morally, or even just honestly, is not necessarily the standard option for a state. For a start, our government, like so many others, maintains a well-funded and activist secret service. Let's admit that the very purpose of a secret service is to obtain information and secure results by extra-legal means. Extra-legal is, of course, a euphemism. It's a long time since the US Secretary of State declared that gentlemen do not read each other's mail. So let's not get too hung up on our own or anyone else's moral superiority, at least in that regard. So it's not, therefore, a question of whether a state's action is moral or not. It's whether the degree of morality or amorality is within that state's degree of tolerance. There is no absolute measuring stick, but rather a sliding scale and one which changes over time and place. What a government must be aware of is to ensure that in its desperation to meet the media's and the public's demand for morally justified or justifiable policies, it does not fall into the trap of exaggeration, illogic or plain dishonesty. And there are so many wonderful examples. I'll quote just one to you. You remember Maureen Dowd of the New York Times wrote as follows about the Bush administration's moral justification of the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Iraq. She said, OK, I'm on board. We're going after a Middle Eastern state with a terrible human rights record, which treats women appallingly and is bullying to its neighbors. OK, I'm on board. We're going to invade Saudi Arabia. <laughs> So that brings us to the fourth and last and the most entertaining uh, section, which is where governments act not just immorally or amorally, but not even in their own national interests. No government, of course, would ever admit to such a thing, but it's a contested field. Let's go back a bit and have a look at, uh, at some of these. I always think of an action which could hardly be moral because it was so excruciatingly contrary to the national interest of the state concerned. And this, occurred in uh, the beginning of the Pacific War, 1941-42. Uh, New Zealand was, uh, well, I'll, I'll skip all that then. Uh, <laughs> a similar issue of states acting not in their real national interest comes when they or their leaders are motivated by local pressure groups who are seeking preferential treatment. The classic example of this is the urging by private interests for governments to make national decisions on their behalf for reasons of company profit. That's uh, what's good for, the, for General Motors is good for the USA, as the song went. An extreme example of this was the British government's waging the opium wars against China at the behest of the East India Company. An Australian newspaper recently carried an article criticizing lobbying by what it called Australia's China-dependent plutocrats. Urging, urging Australia to take a more accommodating, that is, obsequious line on various matters of interest to China. And there are, of course, a number of domestic lobby groups who seek to influence national decision-making in favor of another country, uh, such as the Israel lobby's pressure on the US at the time of the Iraq invasion in 2003, or indeed, more generally, uh, you might call this the Jonathan Pollard. So it's time to look very closely when private or sectoral interests seek to overwhelm national ones. And finally, what about foreign, foreign policy actions carried out by members of a government for largely their own domestic political advantage, regardless of or even contrary to any genuine approach to the national interest? Here, a government would no doubt always try to find at least a fig leaf of moral justification and may even succeed in bluffing its way through the media's short attention span. The Abbott government's high-profile preoccupation with Islamic terrorism is often held to be more closely related to its perception that this plays well to its political poly than to a genuine belief in the immediacy of the threat. Perhaps this is another consequence of the reported rise of professional political staffers and their dominance over the bureaucracy's regular input into ministerial policy decisions. We should fear the triumph party, sensitive, vested interests, uh, and or political gamesmanship over genuine preoccupation with the national interest. In conclusion, uh, therefore, in this section, uh, 
Please look carefully when a government claims loudly that it's chasing a great moral idea. We seem reluctant to look at our own international action as a pursuit of our national interest, which is, after all, a pursuit of the general interest of all the people, and there's nothing wrong with that. A country like Australia, obviously, must seek to act morally, and that goes without saying. But too often, we perhaps go too far in churning up moral justifications, in several of them, which are just not believable. And that has a long-term effect on our diplomatic credibility. Um, I'm going to skip uh, a whole bunch of it. I've got a little chunk here on decency. Can I go on for a little minute? <laughs> I'll go on to the separate uh, copy of decency because that's also such fun. I'd like to get home with this thought. Uh, Australia, we Australians think we're a pretty decent lot. Others may have a different view. For example, our campaign for the USC, UNSC Security Council had a slogan, we do what we say. Campaign over, we dropped so many of those campaign promises. We should not forget that a country's reputation is its most valuable commodity in international relations and not to be trashed lightly. Australia's sense of decency should always inform our actual handling of relationships with other countries. It's particularly true in the Pacific, where our record has not always been good. One of the worst examples in recent times was the abrupt decision by the then Transport Minister, Laurie Brereton, to cancel passport-free travel to Australia from New Zealand. It was done virtually overnight and with neither consultation nor warning and in an area of vital interest to NZ. It was, frankly, not a decent way to behave and imagine the outcry here if something similar were done to us. Indeed, our handling of the Pacific countries has so often left a lot to be desired. This will become an ever more acute problem for Australia given the increasingly less amenable attitude towards us in the Pacific. How many times have Australian Prime Ministers not bothered to attend the Pacific Forum, the annual meeting of their Pacific counterparts? And by way of comparison, how loudly we complain if, for example, the US does not send adequate level representatives to things like the APEC meeting or ASEAN Plus meetings. I've often felt that if larger countries than Australia treated us the way we treated the smaller Pacific countries, we would complain indeed. Australian foreign, minister and, the Australian foreign ministers and their ministries need to remember the adage, do unto, other, uh, do unto others. It's not that hard, it's the decent 